Daniel, how's it going in PV? Oh, awesome, Risa. Um, we've been swamped. November is around the corner. The high season's almost here. And a lot of these snowbirds are contacting us. Uh, they're ready to, to make a move, either like long-term rental or, or they want to uh, start looking at a place to purchase. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that's actually our topic for today because winter is right around the corner for so many of us. Um, and that is often, for those of us who are in New York, often equated with snowbirds. My in-laws are snowbirds. I hope to be a snowbird very soon. Um, and so I thought that we could talk about uh, preparing to be a snowbird. So if you're thinking about being a snow, becoming a snowbird in Mexico, I think that there are a certain number of things that you'd be thinking about at this point, um, whether it's flights or accommodations and the like. And, and then there's some less obvious things that I think that people should be thinking about if they're thinking about taking their car or taking care of their pets and meds and that sort of thing. Um, so. I mean, I know you've probably met many, many people who, who snowbird in Puerto Vallarta. Um, what would you say are some of the key things that people should be thinking about um, when they want to spend a few months in Mexico? Yeah. Well, for example, in Vallarta, you know, it's, it's one thing being a tourist, being here for like a week or two. And it's totally different if you're going to be staying long term, like you said, for a few months at a time. We have a lot of clients, you know, from from Canada, you know, where it's I think a bit colder than most parts in the United States, uh, that do wind up staying here, you know, like for six months, which is the entire what we call like the high season, which is from like November and beginning of November until the end of April. So, you know, if you're going to be staying here for the long term, you know, the place that you're staying, you know, for a week or two might have been great, you know, as a regular tourist. But if you're going to be here for half a year, you know, some of these neighborhoods might not be ideal for you. So I would say, you know, first explore the different uh, neighborhoods, the different regions. And in, in, and in Banderas Bay, where Vallarta is located, we have like three primary areas. There's the Riviera Nayarit, which is the northern part of the bay. And we have Puerto Vallarta, which is in the center part. And on the southern end, we have Costa Alegre. All three of those regions uh, offer something completely different. The topography is different. The lifestyle is different. So if you're going to be staying here for a long time, you know, consider looking at these three big regions to see which one of these areas is really more aligned uh, with your preferences and lifestyle and, and budget. Right. And actually, even before you get to figuring out where you want to live, um, whether it's Vallarta or some other place in, in in Mexico, uh, there's the visa question, right? Um, yeah. Most North Americans can go um, to Mexico on a tourist visa up to 180 days, but that is actually not guaranteed anymore. Is that right? Well, yeah, it, it never was guaranteed, you know, but the maximum you can stay in the country as, as, a, as a tourist, not a, not a temporary or permanent resident, just like a regular tourist that's coming and going, the maximum without having to leave the country and come back in is 180 days. It's not guaranteed that the immigration officer is going to put 180 days on, on your tourist card. Um, you know, especially you know if you if you have a flight that's going back. Let's say you know you're going to be here for 60 days, for example, right? Uh, but you might extend. But they're not going to put. A, why would they put 180 days for you to stay here? They're looking at your your return flight, and you're going back in 60 days, right? So if you do want to stay for a longer period of time make sure that, that that visa does does allow that you know otherwise you'd have to like fly out or drive across the border and then come back in right and that's a really really important thing because i do believe that they're not getting um more strict on these visas but they're really looking and they're really i think in in days past you know 180 days was a lot easier to do than now right um, yeah i mean it, you know it, now, I've been in Vallarta now, living here full-time almost 20 years. I, I think in two weeks it'll be 20 years. I can't wow. believe it. But, yeah, but back then, you know, yeah, they would probably put 180, 180, just kind of. But nowadays, you know, that, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it was never guaranteed back then, but I think that it was a bit, bit more lenient back then. So now they're kind of keeping an eye out and, and being a little um, a bit more responsible uh, to, to say, you know, instead of just putting 180 on everyone. To, they might say 90 days. They might say 45 days. So just make sure that you're in the country legally and, and it's, uh, you, don't, you don't get into trouble. 
Right, exactly. Um, so when you're looking for accommodations and you're looking for an apartment to rent, let's say, um, while you shop for, to purchase a condo or a house, um, how does the rental process work? Is it the sort of thing where it's like the U.S. where you often give like a down payment, like a, a month security um, and then first month's rent type of thing? Or does it work differently? How do you even do referrals if your landlord is not, you know, English speaking? Does that often come up? Um, or is it often the case where foreigners are renting to foreigners, that sort of thing? Okay, so let me answer your 100 questions. <laughs> <laughs> Just one by one, okay? How much time do we have, Risa? <laughs> Clearly, okay, this is so... something that's very personal and of interest to me, so. <laughs> Buy me a drink first, jeez. Um, well, no, when I was renting here long term, you know, my, my, well, my landlord spoke English, but that's not always the case. So you can, if you have a friend who speaks uh, Spanish, um, that's great. You know, if, you have, if you're working with a rental agent or a rental broker, you know, hopefully they speak Spanish, um, but you know, it's like a, our purchase sale contracts in Vallarta for, for resale properties, uh, they're usually in Spanish and English, but the rental contracts, that's not always the case. It might be just in Spanish. So the English is always a courtesy translation, by the way. So if you ever go to court, the Spanish side prevails, right? That's the native language. But the rental contracts, you know, I, I, I see less bilingual contracts, you might say. Um, so you want to make sure that you know what you're signing. You have someone who's going to trans, uh, translate for you. Um, nowadays, you know, it's some landlords are having this contract signed at the notary's office. Some don't. Uh, so by the time I, I, I left my old apartment that I was renting for a number of years, the last couple of years, you know, I think the landlord had problems with other tenants and some of her other buildings. So then she wanted, you know, all the leases signed at the notary's office. So it was no problem for me, but that's kind of what she's decided to do to streamline. Um, and they typically ask for, you know, the, the first month security deposit, you know, for damages. Um, and then uh, the last month. So, you know, you might have to put like two months worth of rent uh, and a security deposit. That's, that's fairly standard, but but it might not be for everyone. Um, some some landlords, they just might you might say, okay, I want to rent for six months. They're not going to give you a lease. They'll you'll just pay, you know, on a monthly basis. You don't have anything signed. Some places you do have something signed. So it's it's kind of I don't want to say all over the map, but you do have those variances. Right, right. Well, that's really helpful actually because I think that um, you know before you actually even go to Mexico, you kind of want to create a budget for yourself, right? And it's good to know what your upfront costs are going to be. Um, so say for like cost of living, you know, for the for the months that you're going to be there, um, you know, I don't want people to assume that, you know, their budget, whatever their budget is now in the U.S. or Canada or wherever in the world would be the same in Mexico, but it's also not necessarily going to be, you know, extremely cheaper. Like some people think, oh, Mexico is so cheap, it's so cheap. Um, and that may be true in some parts of Mexico, but I feel like kind of these bigger cities who that have become very popular amongst ex expats, um, it's not necessarily so. Would you agree with that? Yeah, just like the United States, I think some of the big cities, the metropolitan cities, the cost of living is higher. Uh, then you go, let's say, I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest or you know some little town out in the, bo out in the boondocks, you know, the cost of living is gonna be totally different over there. So same thing in, in Mexico. You know, via, Things are, generally speaking, more affordable here, you know, and some items are not, like electronics. You know, I can go to, like, Costco in Los Angeles, and the TVs are, like, a fraction of the cost, you know, over here, the Costco that I go to here, and then Vallarta. You know, so not everything uh, is, is discounted here. Uh, there are a lot of things that are more affordable, but some, certainly some things are not. Uh, medication here is a lot more affordable from what I've seen versus the United States, right? I'm from Los Angeles, so I want to compare it to LA prices. Um, so you do want to budget yourself. What's, what's your rent going to be like? And some, some uh, landlords are now charging in dollars, so it might not be priced in pesos. They want dollars. That's something you're going to have to negotiate to see if you can pay in pesos. Or if you do prefer to pay in dollars, uh, then that might just work for you. So really, just kind of keep an eye out for that. So budget yourself for the rent. Uh, are the utilities included? 
So usually if it's a long-term uh, rental, the utilities are in addition. If you're renting for like a week or two, like through an Airbnb, usually the utilities are included, right? There's no additional utilities fee. Uh, so, so what utilities are you gonna pay? You know, gas, water, electricity, internet, cable. Um, transportation, are you going to rent a car? Are you gonna drive your own car across the border? So um, are you gonna get international uh, uh, Car insurance, are you going to get car insurance over here? Are you planning on having a Mexican license plate vehicle? A factor in, you know, the cost of, of gas. Cell phone, are you going to use your U.S. or Canadian cell phone? Or are you going to get a, a Mexican SIM card to put in your phone? So if you're going to get a Mexican SIM card, is it going to be a long contract? Are you going to, go, are you going to pay as you go, which is pretty popular here in Mexico? Um, the cost of food, do you like to dine out all the time or do you like to cook? Do you want to go to big box grocery stores or do you want to go to the like the mom and pop individual little farmers market or something that's all that's peppered through the romantic zone and other other parts of town? Um, and then some travel expenses. Are you planning on traveling other other parts of Mexico, getting in your car for example, you know we're in Vallarta, you're going to get in your car and you're going to go to Sayulita, spend time over there a week or two, so kind of factor all that in. Um, your meds. <clears throat> Are you going to be bringing your meds for the entire duration of your, your stay, whether it's three months, six months, or a year? Uh, you know, if, you, if you run out of those meds or, or you forgot to bring them or they're expired or what have you, can you get those, those medic same medication here or something comparable? So that's really important, I think. A lot of people don't think about that sometimes. Uh, you should. Um, if, if, like I said, you have a fur baby, do you have a pet? You know, I have two little dogs, so uh, is there, have you found out where's a good vet that can take care of your dogs? God forbid something were to happen, right? Just even just for grooming purposes as well. Um, and then, you know, entertainment. What do you like to do? Do you like to go to nightclubs? Are you going to go to the movies? Are you going to go watch shows? You know, what do those things run? Um, so those are a lot of things to, to, to consider. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, but it does require some some time and for you to, to kind of put your thoughts on paper and just kind of get a rough idea of what, what it's going to cost uh, for you to, to live um, in, in Vallarta or wherever else in, in Mexico. Also, you know, if you're retired, Social Security, you know, how are you going to get your Social Security checks? Banking, you know, are you going to be using your U.S. or Canadian debit card all the time or, or do you plan on opening up a bank account uh, here in Mexico? and putting money in there and just using your Mexican debit card or getting a Mexican uh, credit card, you know, if you're a resident. Um, so kind of there's a lot to think about, you know, and it's doable so long as you plan and you got a cute little Excel spreadsheet put together and you have a, like a rough number, I think that'll make life a lot easier. Oh my God, my head is spinning. That's, it's just a lot. Um, <laughs> you asked. Let me ask you. So. <laughs> Do a lot of people use pesos? Do they still use cash in Mexico? Or do you find, you know, credit cards also work? Like if you have like a no foreign trans, um, if you have a credit card that has no foreign transaction fees, is that better to use? And is that widely accepted there? Yeah. All right, so, you know, it's not uncommon for some of the smaller uh, independently owned businesses, like restaurants, cafes, like, you know, mom and pop uh, clothing stores or what have you. I mean, they don't, it's not uncommon for them not to have a credit card terminal. Not every place accepts credit cards. Um, so kind of, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're gonna be charging everything, just kind of make sure wherever you're gonna be going, you know, do they accept credit cards? Um, if they do accept credit cards, don't be surprised if they only accept Visa and MasterCard and not Amex because their fees are a lot higher, all right? So what kind of credit cards do they accept? To, to keep an eye on that, and is there an additional surcharge for that? Um, <clears throat> otherwise, you know, it's, it's cash. But like in the big cities, most of the stores in Vallarta, they do take credit cards. They're just a handful of places that don't, or they have a minimum requirement. So you have to spend at least 500 pesos, you know, or 1,000 pesos for you to use a credit card, not just like you're buying a can of soda or a bottle of water and you want to use a credit card. They might not ac accept it just for that. Right. Exactly. Oh, and, and to then answer your question, Risa, also, you know, some of the banks uh, here in Mexico ha have partnered up with banks in Canada and the States, so they have some type of an uh, alliance. So if you do withdraw cash using your debit card or credit card from the States or Canada, 
at the the ATM for that bank that they're partnered with, uh, they may not charge uh, a, like a withdrawal fee or international transaction fee. So that there are some benefits to that. So look into you know which bank do you have, and usually it's the bigger banks. It's not like the community banks per se, like like Bank of America, Citibank, you know uh, places like that. They do have partnerships with other uh, banks uh, overseas. So there are some benefits to that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So there's clearly a lot of homework that people can do to prepare before they go uh, and get on that plane. Um, and I do encourage people to definitely get their flights sooner rather than later because this is a very popular time uh, for people to head down to Mexico. In fact, I know that you know starting in November and even maybe in mid-October, a lot of the direct flights start to happen, um, which... Yeah. Uh, especially from New York and like Chicago and some of the bigger cities, Toronto um, and the like that are not common during the summer months. So um, there's nothing like getting a direct flight <laughs> yes. to Mexico. It makes it a lot, a lot easier. Um, and I, I say that with, with a lot of seriousness because I travel a lot. And um, so, yeah, so it can definitely help. But, you know, you want to definitely book those flights earlier rather than later. And I think that, you know, with COVID and everything, it's really helped that people, you know, even if you don't know quite frankly, like when you're going to go back, um, you can purchase your ticket and then change your flight. But to your point, I think it's a really good point um, in terms of your visa, you definitely have to be careful, right? Uh, in terms of not overextending your visa, or you know, if you want to extend your stay in Mexico, that your visa actually reflects that, and that you can actually stay in the country um, as long as you want, um, and not have to like kind of go across the border and come back, depending. Um, but yeah, so I mean, as we kind of wrap this up, um, I'm just trying to think of like other things that maybe people really need to be thinking about before they head over. Um, I think the numbers thing is, is really important, right? Getting, getting your numbers down and understanding how much money it's gonna cost you to stay in Mexico, whether it's a month, you know, three months, six months. Right. Um, Something six months else is a also, long time. Also, Risa, you know, if you're going to be renting for the long term, um, don't wait to the last minute to look for a place. So if, like, you know, if you're, if you're if it's November and you're thinking of staying in, in Vallarta for six months starting like December, the middle of December, you know, I can tell you, you can pretty much forget it. And at least in the, in the more popular neighborhoods. So, you know, just try to book a place, if you can, six months, nine, ten months, or maybe even a year in advance. Because some of these popular destinations in Mexico, they're, they're, they're very popular and places are getting booked sooner than later. I do have some clients that have already booked for the next three years. They're coming at the same time, you know, so they've got that time blocked out for them. Otherwise, you know, you might catch, catch yourself, oh, you're going to be, you know, 15 days here, then you have to pack it all up and go somewhere else for a month, and then pack it all up and go somewhere else, and, you know, it's, it's, it's annoying, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, find a place in advance. If you know you're coming down, let's say, you know, June of 2024, you know, don't wait till, till May to look for a place because, you know, you might kind of uh, find yourself in a pickle, right? So book in advance. And also, you know, some of these neighborhoods, you know, it might not be a touristy area. They might not speak English. And are you going to be okay with that? You know, are you going to use your hands to communicate or, you know, uh, learn a little bit of Spanish, which will be nice. To, uh, but so some neighborhoods, there are less English-speaking people than others. So kind of take that into consideration and what your comfort zone is you know, sp uh, trying to speak a, a foreign language. And also another thing is, uh, a lot of people don't think about this, is having your emergency contact. You know, if, especially if you're coming down here alone, God forbid something happens to you, who's your emergency contact? You know, whether, whether you know, you're sick or, you, or, you, go, or you, go, you go missing, you know? Who, who knows that you're here? Who can help you out in the case of, of, of you're in a bind? And also consider telling your country's consulate, you know, where you are. So if, if something were to happen, you know, they know that you're where you're at, and they know, you know, where they're going to come and, and, and visit you, or, or if your family's looking for you, you've gone missing, or whatever. You know, whatever can happen. I can't, you know, think of all the different scenarios. But like, well, no. you did have a friend who got suddenly ill, actually. Yeah, yeah, a friend of mine, 
Um, she got suddenly ill January 1st and, and passed away, unfortunately, you know, nine days later. And that was her emergency contact. So, you know, I was at the hospital. I was kind of like the liaison between uh, Pamela Thompson. She's in the healthcare field here. She's fantastic for the, for the native English speaking people. She's kind of like a, like the godsend, you know, she's, she helps get you connected with the different hospitals, the different doctors. So I was communicating with Pam um, and the family, my friend's family back in the States, just kind of coordinating all of that and putting it together. Um, otherwise, you know, it just, it just, it would, it would have been, a, it would have been a mess, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, we've interviewed Pam for our program, Dream Retirement in Mexico, and she emphasizes that over and over again, right? Do not um, overestimate the power or the importance, rather, of the emergency contact uh, because it's true. You don't know what's going to happen, and you definitely just want to have some sort of plan in place um, in case, yeah. God forbid, something does happen. So yeah. that's really, really great advice. So thank you. And which leads me, actually, we do have a free webinar for anybody who's interested. If you're interested in perhaps retiring or relocating to Mexico permanently or semi-permanently, uh, we have this free webinar where we talk about some of the more popular places that expats have been relocating to. Uh, Daniel goes into some of the buying basics um, if you're interested in buying property. And then Pamela Thompson, a healthcare specialist, she talks about some of the healthcare options available for foreigners, which is really essential and um, really, really important, especially if you're if you're planning on moving to Mexico. Um, you know, and then while you're down in Mexico as a snowbird, and I think this happens to many people, is that they go down there for, you know, one year, two years, three years, five years, and then they decide, you know what, I really think I want to retire here. And so during your time in Mexico, during those winter months, is a great time to kind of explore different neighborhoods and to hire your real estate agents, your real estate professional like Daniel, um, to then start looking around and seeing what is available um, and what kind of property may be desirable for you. Um, do you find that a lot of snowbirds are actually shopping, shopping around for properties while they're there? Yeah, you know, they, they'll come down here for about a month or two. Um, and actually, you know, there's a client right now who's coming down, I think they're coming down like the middle of December uh, until the end of January. So they're gonna rent long-term and they're planning on renting in, in a couple different neighborhoods and to get a vibe for that neighborhood at night and you know, see what kind of lifestyle there is in the day versus night. So they can decide now which neighborhood is really more in line with their lifestyle and uh, where, they, where they want to have their Mexican home. So it's, it's, it's very common that people do wind up staying here, renting uh, for, the, for the purpose of figuring out where they want to have their next home. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, Tanya, if people want to contact you or learn more about you and Tanya Chemsian Properties, where do they go? Sure. Just go to our website. It's tanyalchemsian.com. That's T-A-N-I-E-L-C-H-E-M-S-I-A-N.com. And all our contact awesome. info is there. Awesome. Tanya, as always, thank you so, so much. This has been so helpful and amazing. And I hope to see you in Puerto Vallarta this winter. All right. Perfect. Lisa.